I want to start um, with the year 1986. Um, that was the year I arrived in Canada. Actually, just a little bit older than my daughter there, now I realize. Not even one year older. And like every other Chinese student or maybe any other graduate student just arrived, uh, you check around uh, among your fellow students as to which professor to approach. Right? You ask for advice. Uh, the only advice I got from the only other Chinese student at SFU School of Communication is don't ever get close to that professor, Dallas Smythe. <laughs> The reason he had very strange, even dangerous ideas about China. <laughs> and now you can see I have done off the mobile phones, off the cars, all that. Uh, so I was a little bit confused. And even before I figured out what to do with that advice, Dallas Smythe had decided to reach out to me. How? Through his famous free lunch. <laughs> you know, he wrote about free lunch, right? So, uh, fortunately, because there was another Chinese student there, she's an overseas Canadian Chinese, or Chinese Canadian, her name was, uh, is Amy Liu. So, even before I found my place as a view, really, just newly arrived, like her, her age, uh, I got an invitation, lunch invitation, from Amy Liu to have lunch with Dallas. So, uh, I forgot about the conversation, but I have in my hand the manuscript of the bicycle's what. And uh, as Tom Skubak told in uh, the book that he added out of Dallas papers, uh, that article uh, actually was never published during uh, Dallas' lifetime. But it got a legendary status among uh, Dallas peers. And I suspect I might be the last one to, got, uh, to get an original copy uh, of that article. And I remember at the time I got it, it was already pretty yellow, the paper, and uh, you know, it was typed right, and I still have it. So uh, it really, really, and that's the beginning. So because of that, because of that free lunch, I feel kind of obligated to attend his undergraduate class because he was not teaching graduate class anymore. So I remember he was uh, lecturing probably his political economy uh, communication fourth year. Uh, international political economy communication. So I had the opportunity to uh, audit that course. So now uh, let me uh, turn to the formal part of my presentation because that article, that encounter, it really, really changed my entire experience of graduate studies. So Smith, as some of you know, made two trips to China in the early and late 70s to study ideology, technology, and the Chinese struggle to build socialism. His interviews with officials and academics uh, led him to conclude that while proletarian politics were being put in command of all cultural life, uh, he noted that a common cultural heritage of capitalist thinking continue to inhibit Chinese academics from seeing the political nature of techniques and the technology. So uh, he was really worried. He said he had a gut feeling that this could be a problem in Chinese struggle for socialism. And uh, realizing that this is more than just a question of scholarly concern, and I'm speaking to the theme of this conference, the point is to change it, right? Smith submitted his report to the Chinese authorities as a piece of friendly criticism from a concerned family member <laughs> within the international socialist movement. And it was because of that, that was an internal friendly conversation that he kept his promise not to publish as a scholarly uh, uh, publication. Talk about, you know, publishing, perish, climb up the ladder, all that kind of thing. So, of the bicycles, posed a fundamental developmental question. And uh, 
basically a choice between production for capitalist accumulation and collective social needs. He says that at that time during the, his first visit, 1771-72, that the Chinese are almost uh, being able to meet the basic, you know, everyday needs. And so what's next? And he actually visited hung Hungary as well. And he visited China, study, you know, prospects of socialism in these countries and he posed the question about cost and that's why so of the bicycles what is really a metaphorical question for the Chinese thus began the historical encounter between the scholarly paroxysm of Western critical communication scholars and the Chinese struggle for socialism really Dallas is the one who got that started uh, of course he saw the blind spot debate which is really an uh, internal more theoretical explain the world part and this is the change the world part uh, the explain, explain the world part brought uh, balance to debate with uh, people like Graham Murdoch the British oriented more British uh, scholars within the Marxian tradition but the practice part the change in the world part bring brought Dallas to in this encounter with the self-styled Chinese socialist or communist. Of course, Smith never got a reply from the Chinese authorities, <laughs> as we know, but as we know, the indirect response from the post Mao China has been a thunderous. Of course, cause. China now is the largest car market in the world, right? Along with all the transnational consumer capitalist relations and the environmental destruction that private automobiles building. And, uh, you know, just a month ago, China celebrates October 1st National Day and uh, talk about the highway carnages and all the uh, traffic jam, it's all joke. Um, so this has been, of course, you know, this, you know, um, being part of this history of capitalism, which to which China is now so deeply integrated, right? So actually, um, Smith already predict, you know, the, the class struggle that uh, will happen and in his, in, in his in de uh, dependency world which published in 81 he had this paragraph assuming as I do that Mao Zedong correctly predict the zigs and the zags of China's struggle towards socialism it seems obvious that the fuel is being accumulated which will power a later phase of class struggle taking off from where the cultural revolution ended and how far-sighted he is we can read what's going on in China from this so, you know, as I say, speaking of the fuel, right, being accumulated worldwide in general and in China in particular during capitalism's current crisis, um, the post-2008 uh, period have witnessed all kind of square politics, coups, all kind of political crises, social struggles in the world. In China, of course, China will never disappoint the world. And we have this, you know, the rise and the fall of the so-called Tongti model. And behind that, and that's the rest of the world see, is this Hollywood style high political drama, right? Talk about Hollywood, just can't believe there's anything more uh, thrilling than Hollywood. Uh, with this, uh, this drama that ends with the Michael blog, the trial of Bo Xilai in September two, 2013, just two months ago. And for those of you who follow this, you know there's a British guy, man, businessman, but po possibly a spy being murdered. Then there's this Chinese high level official fled to the US embassy. So this is really a transnational drama. We're talking about process, Smith will talk about transnational class struggle, I'm sure. Uh, so, so this is the one side at the elite level. Then you have escalating localized struggles on a daily basis. Then also, of course, you know, as a part of this dialectic of Chinese reform, you have the growing influence of a radical left intellectual ferment. So it's to these three aspects I'm going to focus uh, a little bit detail. So the first part, the rise and the fall of the Chongqing model and the Bo Xilai saga. No, Siege, sorry, it's saga. <laughs> it's Siege. Uh, as a manifestation of ongoing class struggle within the CPP. Actually, again, Smith, in his dependency road, uh, 
write up, wrote about this, has this paragraph because at that point, you know, he was still referring to um, the East European countries and the Soviet Union. He talked about how class struggle within socialist societies, indeed, within the CCP, well, within the Communist parties, it's the core of the progress towards uh, socialism. And then he also know how, actually, in Soviet Union, East Europe, they deny the existence of they struggle. And this, of course, is exactly what's happening in China. Because the whole Boshi Lai thing is framed as an anti-corruption. Totally focused on his uh, personal side, right? So, but I think it's important not to allow that frame to uh, obscure what's really going on. So the Chongqi model, of course, it's really nothing radical. Some people say, oh, that's not really you know, radical enough. It's just a reform attempt, a reform of the reform, just try to contain the excesses of neoliberal reform. But it, it does contain a very important class dimension, and so what's significant in, in several ways. The first is that it has a politics of redistribution in favor of the lower social classes through a revitalized public sphere. The slogan is common prosperity. Yes, some of the leftists critique him for not arguing to abolish private property, which is true, but even the term common prosperity apparently was radical enough in China. Also, Bo Xilai revived a mass mass line policy. He was really ruthless in driving the officials to to live and work with the masses, um, a minimum of one month or something. So that really antagonized the bureaucratic capitalist. And this is his way of achieving official accountability as opposed to liberal democratic institutions. Also, he has an ideological and a cultural dimension, uh, this Chongqi model, that drew upon collective memories of the communist revolution. So the slogan is singing red. Um, also, a law and order campaign, generally law and order campaign associated with right-wing politics. But in the Chinese context, actually in Chongqing, it's associated with left-wing politics, or at least a bit left to the dominant faction of the CCP. Um, so try to uh, basically crack down on mafia style, uh, style capitalism, literally bring back the street, see for the people, really. So um, that's called the strike black. And then also, Bo Xilai actually has emphasized on the environmental dimension. He was the first, among the first, to argue for um, build a green Chongqing, and he put a lot of effort in that. So uh, these are some of the core elements. Uh, and this, of course, happened before, just before the um, November 2012 uh, CCP Party Congress. Uh, so, of course, you know, all the attack against him is, you know, he was just aiming at power. And sure enough, he was, you know, um, brought down through all these kind of, you know, strange happenings. But. Uh, the CCP 18th Party Congress actually reached a compromise uh, in many ways, but it also at the same time continued to mobilize both uh, socialist legacies and the neoliberal strategies, which is also a title, article title I used. So on the one hand, the party reaffirmed uh, the Maoist period as part of China's search for socialism. Because before that, uh, the argument is that, you know, that was totally a chaos, disaster, everything was wrong. Uh, the new leadership said, no, that's also part of the search for socialism, which uh, for China's political discourse is already a big deal. Also, Xi Jinping, of course, announced this China dream, and if you look at the terms, how wonderful those, how can you resist that, right? Prosperous, strong, democratic, civilized. That, we're continuing the white man's burden of civilizing ourselves, right? So, term civilized is a good term. Um, so, hom harmonious, harmonious, marshalist nation. That's the official slogan. Uh, also, Basically, the um, CCP uh, 18 Party Congress, and afterwards, just a few earlier this year, they really steal Bo Xilai's thunder by copying his policy of the reviving the mass line. Now the party is doing mass line, not as ruthless as Bo Xilai, of course. Also, 
At the same time, the neoliberal part comes from uh, private, uh, given a bigger role for private capital, not only just in you know small businesses, but in the commanding heights of the economy, including the first thing the new leadership came in is to corporatize and partially privatize China's railway ministry industry, right? Because now it becomes so profitable. It's such a such a big deal now. Also, core services health care, all that. And also accelerating urbanization by, you know, uh, basically new enclosure of farmlands, uh, pushing for financial liberalization, which is what the U.S. want, definitely. Also setting up the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, which is really, really controversial. Some people are arguing, you know, is this the new, you know, um, a, a new concession area for Shanghai. It's very sensitive for Shanghai, for a city that, you know, had been the paradise of capitalism a century, no, half, you know, less than a century ago. So at the same time, this new leadership, given the environmental crisis, also heightened the rhetoric of building socialist uh, ecological civilization. So that's the top level. I, I won't say that the whole Boshi Lai thing is class struggle. Uh, there are many other dimensions, but I think there are important elements there. But now this, this part I would really want to focus more on class struggle throughout the Chinese society as China rises. That's the big discourse, right? So the post Mao boom, which now made China you know, the second largest economy in the world and the biggest credit to the U.S., uh, credit to, to the U.S., really was based on the political defeat of the urban working class, which was really small, of course, but very significant. Uh, and then, of course, during the reform era is the creation of the 260 million migrant workers as a super exploit semi-proletariat. They're semi-proletariat because uh, these people still have a piece of land in the countryside. And it's because of that, they have some kind of a, uh, always return to your hometown of the your totally exploited, of your fingers were being cut in the factories, of the you're totally disillusioned. So, and of course that land is the fruit of the communist revolution, right? So this reform era really eat off the benefits, the fruits of the Maoist era. Um, but uh, in the long run, the rise of China cannot sustain itself uh, without the rise of the low social classes. And this is not a low social classes that can put up with a lot of uh, repression. After all, they are in the Chinese state constitution being seen as the masters of the country, right? So uh, migrant workers and the rural populations are of course right now at the forefront of the social struggle. And this struggle intensified by the day. And it appears in many forms, of course. Uh, of course, and then many have discussed the implications of this struggle. Li Mingqi, who is a, a Chinese diaspora scholar in the US, has gone so far as to argue that the creation of a large working class and its rising bargaining power and organization capacity in China will not only turn the global balance of power again again to the favor of the global working class but put so much pressure on the capitalist profit rate and accumulation that it will bring about the eventual demise of the capitalist world economy as we know it so we will see but I, I, I won't go so far but I, I do want to emphasize that the Chinese working class are very significant and what they do what they what how they think about themselves uh, is a key part of communication studies, really. So, the many dimensions of class struggle in China, I want to give you some overview of it. Of course, the first part is the, you know, the, the, the old working class, right? Those ones who one time were healed as the master of the country. They were being, you know, pushed aside through the privatization in China's Rust Belt, mostly in Northeast China. And of course, the most moment, dramatic moment, which just shocked myself, was one of the managers were beaten to death by workers, thousands of workers. And there was a discussion as to why the iron, you know, the fists of the Chinese workers are so strong. Well, they have moral claims to the state. They say, hey, this is a worker state. And the state couldn't do much to them, really. Uh, so, um, of course, and there's also the new working class struggle against super exploitation in the Sun Belt, mostly in Shenzhen. And even, you know, the Foxconn, uh, 
mass suicides, it's itself a death form of protest. Suicide as a means of struggle, really. Um, so they have a huge impact, actually, for the rest of the working class. In Beijing, you know, some, some people who cut my hair, last, when I went back, asked her, said, oh yeah, our boss visited us, our salary got raised in the aftermath of the suicide, the Fox and Walker suicides, because the state really gets scared. So, um, and of course, anti-new enclosure struggles. Um, and here it's very important for me to point out that notwithstanding Western media framing of this struggle in liberal democratic ideology, especially in terms of village electoral politics, in this famous Chinese village that's called Wukan. For those of you who read New York Times, you have heard about this. But election is really only part of the story. It's important to note once again, you know, these people are arguing for the socialist state to deliver its promise. It's land ownership politics. It's not just electoral politics. Um, also, actually a lot of this struggle, and this again again is being confirmed by sociologists uh, like Ting Kuan Li. Rather than aiming at regime change and not with them again, you know, Western liberal inspirations, which I will show you immediately, the majority of these struggles aim at compelling the CCP to fulfill its revolutionary promises. That's the language of struggles, talking about ideology and culture, right? Yes, there are liberal inspirations. Here is one. <laughs> this is one man, and he's a rich man, actually. He's a boxer. And this is a real figure. He was the one who refused uh, the uh, local whatever developer to uh, demolish his house. But he really was getting a lot of help and he's not a poor peasant or whatever. So this is the liberal version, liberal interpretation, okay? It's French Revolution, right? Uh, but, and also there are other anti-corruption, you know, anti-corruption was a very important appeal. Punish corruption, return my land. This is a massive, more in a ruler setting. And then, you know, in the kind of traditional Chinese remote restriction tradition, central government, please help, right? Again, it's appealed to the, uh, it's played a tension between local and central authorities, right? Here is CCP, please save me. <laughs> and dedicate to the CCP's birthday. That's the last line, okay? Uh, Mao's discourse, this is the famous Mao uh, slogan, right? Wherever there's oppression, there's resistance, there's struggle. That's posted on that line. And then this one, long live harmony. Well, the party said harmony, right? Chairman Mao is dear, CCP is good. And then underneath the black thing is illegal uh, demolition, okay? And then this one, being dispossessed, Demolished of the fan sheng, you know, fan sheng is the famous, uh, yeah, term, right? Made famous by actually um, he, William Hinton, right? Missing Chairman Mao. Okay, and here the international must be realized. This is another struggle in front of uh, uh, somewhere, um, them, uh, basically a construction. Um, development office. This one is most extraordinary, okay? This old man with, you know, this blanket around him was a old revolutionary soldier, fought against uh, the Japanese and then the, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek regime. Now he's fought, fought, he's fighting against land seizure, house demolition with, uh, you know, his, his spouse. Even more outrageous. He auctioned off his war price, this bozo behind. Um, so it, it, these are all, you know, some of the striking images. So in addition to this, of course, you know, given, you know, China's for many, you know, this era of reform is also an era in which the Chinese state really played the second fatal to the U.S. So the nationalistic questions still become very uh, touching. Uh, of course, the national angle is very complicated with, you know, ethnic conflicts in Xinjiang and Tibet, and also the Han Chinese are not, you know, should not be excused for its chauvinistic attitudes as well. But to the extent that China continues to support itself to the U.S. and to the extent that the U.S. Asia allies, especially Japan, uh, continuously engaging China, you know, in this kind of territorial disputes, nationalistic protests remain a powerful challenge against the CCT's, CCP's claim to 
uh, defend China's territorial integrity and national dignity. After all, that's part of the legitimacy of the CCP, right? So this can be especially threatening when it's intertwined with a social dimension. And here is the, the most dangerous slogan. Uh, just before the party congress last year, uh, so the Diaoyu Islands, which is the island, which are the islands that China is in dispute with Japan, right? Belongs to China, but then Bo Xilai belongs to the people, and this is really dangerous for for the party the, for the Xi Jinping leadership. Um, so this was the the protest just before the party congress, which was held in. Uh, November and you can see you know this is behind a car uh, the same slogan so apparently you know these are not you know if somebody can drive a car and then um, also you know spot this kind of slogan it means that this this is more than just you know some some really really poor under uh, under class um, and on top of all those is the urban middle class environmental struggle, uh, the environmentalism of the discontent. Some of these are really not in, not in my backyard type of thing. And it shows, you know, the Chinese urban middle class, once they got their, what they have, they're going to protect it. They're not going to allow further development. They're going to protect their real estate, protect their thing. So. So this, you know, this kind of protest has just gone up astronomically uh, in the past few years. This under, undermines local official legitimacy, but also, of course, fit into the party's ecological civilization agenda. So the third part of this is so the elite struggle, the uh, bottom-up struggle, and then the return of the suppressed left in the media and the intellectual fields. And this is all about the winning the hearts and minds of China's youth. Uh, for a long time, and actually in my own work, I've documented the neoliberal domination in China, in media and the intellectual fields. But this has been challenged, both at the elite and the popular level, within and beyond China, and we're speaking about all, almost like a transnational Chinese intellectual community. And it's in this context that, you know, I, I can see, uh, even from my own experience, the re resilience and the growth influence of new left intellectuals. Uh, despite the attacks and the marginalization efforts of right-wing media and their favorite intellectuals, I'm not that big, but I have my share of abuse. Uh, two weeks ago, and speaking of awards, and I, again, you know, this may be coming out as, uh, it's, it's, you know, this is something really significant for the Chi entire Chinese intellectual field. It was Wang Hui, the leading Chinese intellectual, new left intellectual, two weeks ago, he was awarded uh, the 12, 13, 2013 um, Luca um, Pasioli Prize, shared with Hab Habermas. That's a big deal, right? Uh, so, the new left critique is complicated. It's not one dimensional, and also the label itself is meant to delegitimize you. In China, the, the, the label you want to avoid is left, right? So, so, it's a label that the right applies to the left. Uh, so, they, you know, these this scholars try to defend the historical legitimacy of the communist revolution. That can no longer be taken for granted in China during the reform era. Everything is wrong, revolution is wrong. If the 49 is wrong, even 1911 was wrong. If only, if only the emperor, you know, uh, the, the emperor, Empress Dowge was accepting reform, then we can have a constitutional monarchy. Like the UK, isn't that wonderful? That's how far the liberal intellectuals have gone, or not even liberal, some conservative intellectuals have gone. So the idea of defending the 14, 1949 revolution is one of the biggest intellectual tasks. And Lin Chen, who is actually a close friend right now uh, at LSE, wrote, you know, in her, in her new book, which I had a pleasure to review and endorse, uh, called China and the Global Capitalism. Uh, she said, yes, to be sure, the communist effort has a dark side because China's relational position within capitalism in its historical and international context explains the country's limited policy options and their underlying rationality and coherence. And she was saying that the practitioners of Chinese socialism were keenly aware of this before smart revisionists and the historical nihilist crusaders rose to attack everything communist. And bold attempts at surmounting those that contradiction 
is also part of the story. Also, the, re the you left has been criticized in the reform era for its capitalistic orientation and how it has played a big role in protecting and saving capitalism. As a, you know, China as a submissive and or reluctant collaborator and as the indirect finance of U.S. wars, even the U.S. strategy of encircling China itself. Talk about irony, right? And the third part, of course, is trying to elaborate uh, a new form of socialism. Uh, try not to uh, abandon the socialist idea altogether. And again, here's Lin Chun, and uh, she has this very uh, elaborate analysis. And in the end, she was saying, you know, uh, isn't the oppositional scenario threatening enough? And uh, she was saying, you know, as if this is a future past. I would be so more, uh, go so far as to say, right now, that is the kind of capitalist dictatorship already we have in China. Uh, so, um, and she actually even go on to propose a Chinese socialist model, you know, talk about a socialist state that has the political power, moral confidence, and popular support, and organizational policy capacity to mobilize human and material resources to make the Chinese nation strong and prosperous, a strong resource for public sector, which again, right now, is really in the middle of being uh, further eroded, but the struggle is really intense even in these days, maybe in the next few days, because leading to uh, important party con uh, plenum in, in a, probably in this month. Also, uh, argue for the, uh, she argued for the priority of popular well-being or people's livelihood. Uh, basically, that is my idea, you know, produced for public needs. And talk about social organization, participation, and power. Uh, and, uh, and this is something I myself have been arguing, you know, from an eco-materialist perspective. If the Earth's biocapacity cannot accommodate the rights of China or the rights of other uh, global countries in the global south, as aspired to current Western levels of consumer capitalism, then Dallas Mice uh, and his insistence on the necessity of transforming capitalist production relations assume even more urgency today, not only for the Chinese, but also for our ecologically sustainable future for home humanity as a whole. And this, again, is something that Dallas really, really offer important um, points. So this is, again, you know, I'm quoting myself now. If, in my second book, if socialism is the establishment of a society uh, with the working people as the primary subject, that was the uh, argument made by somebody else. Then I said, perhaps not only the party's official slogan per se, those are still relevant, I guess, but also their appropriation by various Chinese social forces and the unfolding societal processes of supporting both the state and market to the social needs of the working people are what the struggle for socialism in China is about. So. Um, in addition to all those, of course, you have all this flourishing of neo Maoist and uh, other heterogeneous, very heterogeneous, all kinds, socialist discourse online. And one thing I really want to emphasize high here, and again, uh, especially against Western media, is that actually it's the West, the left websites remain the most dev devastated victim of the CCP's censorship regime. Do we, and this is true before, now it's after the uh, Bo Xilai uh, downfall. I just can't imagine if the party did not shut down all those uh, leftist websites, what will happen? Uh, so, uh, in addition to you know those websites that's been shut down and are now getting you know some uh, overseas hosts, all that kind of thing, and they try to forge ahead, uh, there has been nascent working class, new working class communication and culture uh, emerging, and alliance also being made between new workers, migrant workers, and their organic intellectuals. And it's in that context I'm so happy that my dear friend Pu Wei is here. Uh, she did an outstanding presentation uh, about the working class struggle, and I just want to boast that uh, I, I'm partly, not all, responsible for police uh, being uh, radicalized. Uh, actually, when I was at UC San Diego, one thing I did, uh, she was a visiting scholar there, I took her to a com uh, presentation by Angela Davis. And she, um, International Women's Day, and she said, wow. And then I was also responsible for uh, uh, 
introduced her to Jack Q, Qiu Lin Chuan, and now you know they have been really teaming up to do that wonderful work. So there's this new alliance between progressive organic intellectuals of the working class, and they are actually working with the workers. And their model, of course, is very different from the party's vanguard approach. Mao Zedong go to the coal mining, uh, in uh, coal mine, this you know. 20s, that kind of thing. So history almost, I won't say repeat itself, but new struggles are ongoing. So um, during actually during his um, visit, 1971-72 visit uh, to China, Dallas was explaining to his host about you know how Western style television is a one-way television and how it embeds is embedded in capitalist ideology. And he imagined the idea of two-way television. He was encouraging the Chinese to design a two-way television. And that, of course, he got the inspiration from the big character posters that Mao had mobilized for the Cultural Revolution, right? And uh, of course, you know, today, actually, yes, you do have netizens issue calls for new cultural revolution, cultural revolution in new form, uh, to carry out ideological struggles, criticize re revisionism, revisionism, and to discuss the problem of continuous revolution. Yes, this kind of discussion were all ongoing under the watchful eyes of the party, CCP, but I think Dallas might feel partially, at least, redeemed for that. Now, yes, in China, there's indeed the problem act like a two-way, not television, internet, right? So, um, again, you know, just to see how so anti-corruption, right? Uh, because uh, they don't want to touch politics. They don't want to touch policy. So it's all mostly like being a corrupt official, right? This kind of framing actually might have strengthened leftist sentiments among the larger public. Again, as I say, there are empirical survey evidence to support that. So the CCP and the China's pro-capitalist media outlets really risk losing further legitimacy and credibility if they ignore this kind of popular sentiment. Already, the Nanfang group, which some say, you know, in the West is being seen as freedom fighter, but Inside China, many see it as a kind of comparator media or uh, the media of shame. And this is one of the protest slogans that uh, really could key the Nanfang weekend for its neoliberal orientation. By the way, the Nanfang weekend was the paper that singled out by Obama for an interview as a sign of his support for uh, this paper, right? And again, you know, to show that how the leftist critique have put pressure even to this newspaper. This is a, a Nanfang Weekend's uh, uh, weekly magazine. The Nanfang Group is the party's organ, actually, of the Guangdong province. And this is one of the journals associated with this huge party media conglomerate. Uh, earlier this year, uh, this, this um, journal almost like equivalent of China's People's Magazine, I guess, People Magazine, uh, featured the new left youth as its cover. And this is extraordinary. And I read the article, actually the article is not, it's pretty, pretty good, pretty okay. Did not try too hard to marginalize this youth, actually. And you know, you know, my paternal life, this again is a page inside that article, said, no, I'm too left, the world is too right wing. <laughs> And we are people, we are a multitude of people. And again, for this to come from the Nanfang Weekend group of newspapers is quite extraordinary. And so all the ideological work that the new left or the websites, the leftist Maoist website have done must have some impact. Of course, you know, also the reality that you have a new generation of uh, university graduates couldn't find job. That itself is, you know, Re reality is radical. These people get educated, right? So by way of conclusion, I offer slogans. Early on, it's only socialism can save China. Then during the neoliberal era, even today, during the financial crisis, it's only China can save capitalism. <laughs> Remember, you know, Hillary Clinton tried so hard, go, you know, pat the back of Chinese premier, buy more debt, you know, all that, right? Now I think the slogan should be only Ecological socialism can save China and the world. So,
when Dallas Smith invited me for a free lunch and hand me his of the bicycle manuscript 27 years ago, I could not have imagined that the UBC, UDC will invite me for a free dinner tonight. <laughs> And then had me the Smiles Award. It's I just can't believe it. How could I imagine, right? For a girl who didn't even think of going to university. Uh, so as Tom Skubak uh, sat upon receiving his Smiles Award in 1996, the Dallas Smiles Award kept his contributions alive, fresh in your mind. But this award is not about him or about me. It's about you. It's about everybody here. It's about the critical intellectual community that has nurtured me, has been kind and nice to me and very just so extraordinarily helpful to me. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the UDC, the three words that this organization embodies. So follow Gubag and many others. I'm so humbled, honored to share the Smice, I didn't finish the se uh, sentence, the Smice Legacy, the Smice Award. Uh, this my uh, spirit, I accept this award in your names because more than ever we need to carry out critical communication research that associate the struggle for democracy with the struggle for collective social rights. And I believe you know, the, the, what happened in the Arabic world confirms this. Because more than ever, and I'm citing Samir Ami here actually, because more than ever we understand the struggle for democratization and the struggle for socialism are one and the same. <laughs> I accept this award in your name because more than ever we need to follow the footsteps of Dallas Mice to pursue radical scholarship in the international spirit. Not to leave the Chinese struggle for socialism to the Chinese, that's my sentence somewhere, uh, it's not complete. In this stage of Chimerica. <laughs> By the way, Chimerica is a paper I just finished <laughs> three days ago and it will be published in the International Journal, uh, International Journal of Complication, hopefully by November, uh, the end of November, if I got the time to write my introduction. I accept it in your name because more than ever, we need to overcome our own fears, be vigilant against calculated manipulations by racist, sex, and other forms of repressive ideologies that in this time of uncertainty, anxiety, and global turbulence, that's so easy to stir up. We need to struggle for the great unity, solidarity of critical scholars, practitioners, and activists that the UDC embraces. And finally, here's the commercial message. I accept this award with the best wishes for a UDC that will have increasing global reach. And again, I'm so glad that I think Po Wei, you might be the first Chinese scholar come directly from China to UDC, if I'm correct. I might be wrong. Especially China elsewhere in the global south. And it is with this wish that I'm presenting you with my commercial message. My daughter has it actually uh, of the night. Please take home a flyer of my MA double degree in global communication and send me your best student to China through SFU. Because this student actually will go to China. We are recruiting up to a maximum of 10 students uh, from the SFU side, and then we will send them to China for a year. And because the point is indeed to change the world, one student at a time. As an educator, there's not much I can do. I, I just can't, I, I don't have the ability to fight in the Chinese streets. Um, so, one student at a time, even at the cost of free lunch, like what Dallas did to me. So, Thank you, really, um, for this for this tremendous honor. And uh, uh, right now, it's still just beginning, and so there are different directions. One is, of course, you know, Western influenced trade unionism. So there's a lot of effort to organize uh, trade unions, uh, independent trade unions, as a replacement for the official trade union. But then there are other more radical elements We are saying, no, 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 we are not going for the trade unionist road. Our state claims to be a socialist state anyway. So we want to, we already have, theoretically, in constitution, we have state power. Why should we go back to trade unionism?
So there's more radical uh, workers and at least you know some of their organic intellectuals. The idea of try to fight state policies. And of course there are also others, you know, more um, life world related issues of, you know, just uh, fighting for working class rights, benefits, that kind of thing. So it's very difficult to see what kind of form um, that, you know, Chinese democracy will take. Some will argue, you know, the, the idea of the people's democracy and how to concretize it. Um, so, but as far as workers are concerned, I think they are right now, because of the state's uh, repression in many ways, uh, there are not much uh, open discussion, but if you lo look at online discussions, uh, there are still quite a range of possibilities. Uh, the international side, uh, I know there are a lot of voices I'm Hong Kong supported, uh, and uh, some of those Hong Kong groups may have other international sources of support. Uh, labor NGOs and uh, working uh, workers, uh, cultural or rights support groups, and I. I think there's also quite a large struggle surrounding uh, the Foxconn uh, organizing in the aftermath of that, Last, and also with the Hyundai uh, factory struggle. So um, the networks are already being, you know, um, in the in many small ways being established. Uh, in terms of impact, I I think it's still largely um, indirect in the sense that uh, the state is aware of these struggles. On the one hand, they try to crack down. Of course, you know, that you also have, you know, uh, Walmart finally began to officially organize trade unions. Uh, but those can also be limiting and the extent to which those trade unions might end up being like, just like the other official unions. So, um, again, you know, the, I, I think the forms are still very uh, diverse, but also uh, not concretized yet. Just do whatever is possible. And right now, I think a lot of the focus is on uh, benefits, rights, um, just everyday survival. But at the political level, the organization is not there because this is almost impossible. And then the ones that's there, for example, the Walmart trade union, then the extent to which those unions can uh, achieve radical ends are pretty problematic, I think does not have political power. Uh, so the, the political struggle within the Communist Party, like the Bo Xilai Wang, was really the most, ex you know, recent, the most explosive. I think it was beyond, actually, myself couldn't even imagine. I've written about, you know, struggles in my 2008 book. I talk about, you know, the struggle, but I just couldn't imagine that the struggle will happen at this level. Uh, so the notion of you know, a monolithic bureaucratic capitalist uh, state is being broken. But then to what extent Bo Xilai is the new left, uh, or how left he is, is of course questionable. So at the elite level, there's definitely, the highest level, there's still struggle. Yes, some of those are just for blunt power, but I think they're also some policy differences. And then uh, the new lab is right now mostly an intellectual formation. But some of them also have some significant uh, policy, you know, positions. For example, in some places, a university party secretary might have new lab sensibilities. And that's why, for example, I have been able to uh, collaborate with my colleagues in Shanghai to set up uh, a new research center uh, and get some kind of um, if not official support, at least some people out there are sympathetic. And uh, of course, to what extent, you know, these kind of people can have, can gain further political power is questionable at this point. But again, it depends on the strength of social movement. So, so what I want to argue, or at least foreground, is this dynamic intersection between elite and popular struggles, and also the extent to which uh, the party's socialist slogans and its unwillingness to change its name, uh, and to abandon it, by the way, we are a capitalist party, a bourgeois party. Uh, they are, it's no joking, because some people already say that 
the name of the People's Republic of China, the term, the peoples, is really uh, problematic. Let's drop it. Then my joke is, okay, drop it, become Republic of China. Then I said, that name is already taken <laughs> by the regime in Taiwan, right? And that's, and so, so there are all people say, okay, let's just be blunt. And so, but the party couldn't really do that. And that itself put a strain, constraint on um, China. And this is why China's situation is so different from East Europe, from the Soviet Union. The East Europe, the communist regime is mostly, mostly you know, yes, more or less an imposition from outside with, you know, the end of the Second World War, all that. But China, this party came to power through bloody struggles. That's why today the history of the reform period is longer than the history of the Maoist period. 30 years reform, more than 30 years reform, you have not undo Mao. And this year, it's especially interesting. It's an inconvenience year. You know, this year is Mao's 120th anniversary. And I don't know how Mao calculated himself, you know, was born in that year. This is the year that the party's 18 Congress. This is the year so many people just say, okay, let's forget about Mao. And it, it couldn't. And you will watch how the party right now is even debating how to commemorate Mao. And Mao, he said the fact that his existence and the fact that, you know, this year is his 120th birthday matters. So the elite struggle, as I say, the Bolshevik life thing was really, really exploding. You know, during the Bolshevik scandal, all kind of conspiracy theory were floating on China's internet, including one that Dr. Henry Kissinger went to Chongqing, investigated, and he said, no way we can allow Bolshevik life in, in, in Chongqing because he's going to undermine this chimerica formation. So, the, yeah, it's a long answer, but yes, power struggle ongoing, probably more than what we, the Western media like to portray, uh, to present, and some of this struggle cannot be reduced to pure power in a kind of cynical way. There are policy differences, and even though in China there's no electoral politics, uh, the CCP leadership need to respond to popular sentiments and also need to somehow keep that revolutionary legacy going because otherwise how can you continue to roll because your legitimacy is building there and that is the profound contradiction and that's the argument that some of you know the so-called new left try to take advantage of so re-articulate socialism rather than abandon it. And then, of course, this keep, you know, bring this, this kind of re-articulation in conflict with the CCP. So, my, for example, my own work constantly got censored in China. But then, on the other hand, uh, yes, and this award will help probably say, oh, she's a big name, therefore, you know, they, they, they will try to use me in that way. Not because some universities don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But they, they say, oh yeah, she, she, she's somebody we, we might want to invite to give a lecture. And then I end up going there.